right, hey, good evening, Mercy Hill. Before we dive into our sermon for today, uh, I do want to update you guys on hurricane relief efforts. I know that uh, on the forefront of many of our minds is, is how our church is involved. Um, y'all, this is a, a major storm. It's a major event. We're going to be involved for a long time, uh, and, and there's going to be a lot of things that you can jump involved uh, and be involved with over the coming uh, months, but I know that some of us might want to be involved like right now, and so if that's where you are, then go to mercyhillgso.com forward slash hurricane, and what you're going to be able to see there is really the two primary ways that you can help out and be involved right now is to go and to give, okay? Uh, we've had a team already come and go, go and get back. We've got a team there this weekend. Uh, we've got another team that's going out next weekend, uh, so there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you if you're wanting to plug in and to be able to go. Also, there is a link right there on on, uh, on our website that links you to the organization that we are working through, okay? So that's not going to come through us. We're just giving you, making it available for you to be able to give directly uh, to the relief efforts from there. So, man, if God's putting it on your heart to, to do one of those two things, then by all means, I hope you'll get on there uh, and figure that out, all right? And, and we'll, we'll give you updates as we continue to go because, again, this is going to be a long process. So, man, let's just continue to be in prayer for the people there and for the relief efforts. All right, we're going to be in Song of Solomon chapter 3. So if you have a copy of Scripture, you can take it out and turn with me there uh, over the next Next two weeks, y'all, we are going to be talking about manhood and womanhood, okay? We're going to be looking at what the Song of Solomon has to say about our identity, uh, our, uh, it, you know, the image of God that is in us expressed through being a man or uh, being a woman. One of the things that I want to say kind of right up front before we really even get off all the way into this uh, is that, yes, we're going to talk about manhood this week, womanhood next week, and we're going to talk about how those things interplay in marriage because that's what the Song of Solomon is, that's what the Song of Solomon is about uh, is about those two becoming one flesh, and, and we're going to talk about that. But before I even get into that, I want to make sure you understand this point, and I hope to drip this throughout uh, the next sermon as well, but if I don't, let me just say it emphatically once. The image of God, uh, ma you know, man, woman, masculine, feminine, those things are not primarily or ultimately about marriage, okay? And they're not primarily or ultimately about you, God has made you a man for his glory in his image. That's his decision, okay? Or God has made you a woman uh, for his glory in his image, his decision. Ultimately, these things are about the image of God. It's about humanity. What I, what, the reason why that's so important is because, you know, we talk about singleness, and uh, Paul talks about that in the New Testament. He's like, man, I wish, I wish everybody could be as I am. I wish everybody could stay single because there's a single-mindedness and there's a devotion uh, there towards the ministry that you can have. And um, I think sometimes we, we get this wrong in our culture. Like if you don't get married, you don't experience the fullness of manhood. Or on the flip side, the fullness of, of being a woman. That's just not true. Those things are image of God things in you uh, as a, a human being, uh, irregardless of whether you ever get married or not. So I want to make sure I say that. But at the same time, I also want to get into this and talk about how those things interplay in marriage, because that's what the Song of Solomon is about. And that's what we're going to do over the next two weeks, all right? So this week, what I'm going to do, and I'll be talking to the guys, talking to the ladies, I'll be kind of going back and forth, but generally, what we're going to do this week is I'm going to say, ladies, what should you be looking for in a man, okay? Uh, biblically speaking, what are those categories of manhood that you should be looking for, uh, that you should be affirming? Uh, maybe if you're married, you know, the, the, the man that is in your life, like the things that you should affirm in him or uh, the things that you should be praying for in him. But ladies, this week we're going to talk about what should you be looking for, what type of man, who should you be looking for when it comes to marriage? Now, if you're married, don't go looking for another man, okay? That's, that's not the Bible, all right? So I don't want you to hear me say that. If you're already married, it's more about praying for these things in your husband. Uh, it's, it's more about thinking, you know, what, what can I affirm in him, that kind of thing. But if you're not married yet, then yes, the, the answer, the, the, the thing that we're going to, the answer that we're, uh, the question that we're hopefully going to answer today is, who should you be looking for, and what should they be manifesting in life? Next week, we're going to do the exact same thing. We'll just flip it. I'll be saying, guys, uh, what should you be looking for in a godly woman? Now, I think this is so important for us in our culture, and the reason is because, and this is true of much of life, not even just when it comes to dating and marriage, but just in general, y'all, you can affirm this with me, right? Many times in our lives, the things that we look for in the beginning are not the things that matter really in the end, right? Right? And that's true in dating, it's true in a lot of other areas of life. I thought about, uh, I don't give you a different example next week, but I thought this week I just thought about like college students. You know, none of our uh, college students, none of our high school students would do this because they're all super sharp at Mercy Hill and they're way deeper than this. 
But generally speaking, you can Google pretty quick and figure out that much of our country p- picks its college based on the party atmosphere. Like which, which school ha- has the most parties and, uh, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, people pick colleges based on its proximity to the beach or b- based on you know, where, where it's at, climate. And all. There's all types of reasons why people might pick a university. I remember when I was getting recruited to play Division II college football. I'm talking about small college uh, football. You know, you go to small college, they ain't got much to offer, okay? So they're, they're throwing all this stuff. Of the recruiters would always tell you the percentage of campus that was female. They'd be like, hey, we got 65% female on this campus. Like, maybe you got a shot, bud. I guess that's what they were, I guess that's sort of what they were getting at. And, and I just thought, like, what a silly way to pick where you're going to go to school, right? Uh, the, the things that matter to us in the beginning and our immaturity in all areas of life Uh, Many times what mattered in the beginning is not what matters in the end. You know how I know that's true in this example? Because nobody picks a grad program based on those things, right? Like by the time you talk about a grad program, it's like strictly cost benefit. How, what percentage of your uh, graduates get a job in this field? What have your graduates done? You know, like uh, when, when you get a little bit older, it's not about the party atmosphere or, or the Greek life or where it's at compared to the beach or whatever. It's, it's more about just like cost and benefit and those type of things. Why? Because the things that we ask in the beginning aren't always the things that matter in the end. Sometimes we wise up to those things later. Well, let's think about this with dating. Let's think about it with courtship. Let's think about it with marriage, right? Many times in our culture, the things that we think about in the beginning are not the things that matter in the end. Uh, what, what do we do in our culture? Oh, we're going to date somebody, at court, you know, courtship. If you just kind of, if you, if you remove the godly part of it, what, what does our culture say? It's really very simple. Are they hot? <laughs> number one, okay. Number two, are they popular? And number three, you know, do they have money? That's, that's pretty much it. I don't care if you're 15 or 50, they, they look a lot, you know, the questions look a lot different. Maybe if you're 50, you know, people aren't saying, is he, you know, is he a quarterback or whatever, but they're probably going to try to figure out like where in the company is he? You know, do their parents have money? They live in the right neighborhood now turns into what do they drive and, and what kind of, all the questions end up sort of being the same. They're about six inches deep, totally superficial if we sort of are divorced from the major categories of what God has for us. And what I want to try to do today is say, no, let's talk about the deeper categories. Let's talk about the things that we should. Y'all, if we're talking about something as big as marriage, I mean, you know, the questions change. If you're talking about lifelong intimacy and devotion rather than a one-night stand, the questions change, don't they? If we're talking about building a house instead of playing house, then the questions sort of change. And that's what we want to get at today through the Song of Solomon this week and next week. Women, what should you be looking for in a man? Guys, what should we be looking for in them? And this is going to be the same main point this weekend, next week, okay? Uh, and, and here it is. Guys, become the man that God wants, and you will become the man that she wants. If she's godly, if she's asking deeper questions, you know, uh, if she's asking sort of the biblical, the deeper categories, you know, this is about, you know, we're talking about marriage, but y'all, this is about maturity before it's about marriage. It, it, it's, about, it's about maturity in Christ. It's about developing the godly characteristics um, that he has put inside of each one of us. And if we can get that right, if we can grow in our faith and become the man that God wants, then for a godly woman, there's going to be many things in us that are attractive. And ladies, I would just say, man, I, I, I'll tell the guys this next week, so it's nothing I'm just saying to you. Are we looking for the deeper categories? Or are we looking on the surface because those things that matter when you're 15 or 20 or 30, even if you're just dating, they're not going to matter when you're building a house with somebody uh, 20, 30 years down the road, right? When you've built a marriage. So are we asking the deeper questions? I hope that this week and next week uh, we can do that. We can build out some deeper categories that our culture, this is one of those times, you guys hear me say this all the time, we can out narrate the world. We can tell a better story. It's a better story in our love relationships to ask these deeper questions, okay? And God wants us to ask these deeper questions. So let's get to it. We're going to be in Song of Solomon chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 6. I want to show you guys that a godly man is prepared, protects, leads, and is known. He doesn't isolate. He can stand up to the light of the community, okay? So we're going to look at those four things, and that's going to be our time. Let's dive into uh, chapter 3, verse 6, and then I'm just going to systematically check those four off, and that's going to be it, all right? Let's dive in. Verse 6. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant? Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. What that means is like a couch, a carriage. He has built this thing that he's probably riding on that she's going to step up into with him as they go off to their marriage. Verse 9, skip down with me. King Solomon has made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple. Its interior was inlaid with love, 
by the daughters of Jerusalem. Now, what's happening here in chapter three is this, probably, okay? Solomon is coming to take his bride away for the marriage. That's what's going on. He is overwhelming her with, 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 with grace, uh, you know, with his preparation. He's showing her, I wanna give you all of my life, and that shows up in this carriage that he has created, gold, silver, purple, inlaid with artistry. Uh, he is coming, it's a big show. I didn't read this, but he's got 60 warriors that are running before the carriage. He is doing everything to show her, I am coming for you, I'm giving my life to you, and, uh, and, and that's really the first thing I want you to see. Number one, godly men are prepared, okay? That's the first thing I want you to see here. She sees this in him, that he is prepared for her, all right? He has done all of these things to sweep her off of her feet with his preparation. He didn't just wake up this morning and decide, hey, we're gonna get married today, okay? This has been thought after thought, plan after plan going into this. And this preparation is part of her dreams. There's kind of an interplay that's going on here in chapter three, all right? Chapter three, a lot of people argue that this is a dream that she's having. Uh, you could read that in the very first part of the chapter where she says, I'm on my bed at night, I'm having this, seemingly having this dream. Uh, people say, is, it, what, is, this exact, is this historical? Like, did Solomon do this? Or is it a dream that she had? Um, I look at that and I say, why does it matter? Either he is the man of her dreams or he's the man in her dreams. Either way, she wants to be swept away by the preparation that he puts into coming to get her and the seriousness of which he takes this idea of one flesh and them coming together in marriage. I guess I could translate all this uh, by, by just saying this, okay? Guys, she is not the type of woman who is built to be awed by the date that is we're gonna watch Netflix for three hours, sit on the couch, and then end up at Taco Bell at midnight, and we'll just see where it goes. <laughs> She's not built for that, okay? She's not built to get a text message 30 minutes before you get there, didn't even know you were coming, and then you're outside the house beeping the horn instead of walking up to the door, so help me if that ever happens in my house with one of my kids, with my, with my girls, right? She's not built to where it's like you go pick her up, don't get out to even open the door, and next thing you know, it's like, oh, I gotta move all these Mountain Dew bottles off of the seat so you'll have a place to sit down, okay? She's not built for that. What she's built for is for somebody to have taken the time to think and prepare and be creative in the way that you are coming after her to invite her into this lifelong journey with you. Solomon's pursuit of the bride is totally planned. It is prepared. The gold, the silver, the purple of the carriage. You know, purple was more rare in these times than even gold. He thought about this. Everything looked right. Everything smelled right. Everything was just picture perfect that he could make it uh, for her. He was prepared. Now, there's a lot of ways that I could take this, okay? But I want to try to pull two things just right out of the text. The first one is this. Be prepared to share your life, okay? That's the first way that we need to be prepared. Be prepared to share your life. Now, where does that come from? Well, most of the commentaries that I've read and preachers that have preached this before me make this observation that I think is right. His preparation is a pledge, okay? The preparation is, I am pledging my life to you. I'm not just trying to woo you with wealth or whatever, but what I'm saying is in coming in this way with the 60 warriors and the inlaid with gold and everything that I could pour into this moment, what I'm saying is I'm giving myself to you. Like I'm opening myself to you. I'm giving myself all the way other. There's nothing that will be held back. And I think, guys, for us, you know, many times if I can just speak to the men directly, we think about that with what we're thinking about sharing in a marriage. We're going to share bank accounts. We're going to share the marriage bed. We're going to share responsibilities uh, with kids and all of this stuff. But many of us in a distant, distant third put our emotional life in that category that we're gonna share, that we're gonna be open, that we're gonna try to uh, not just kind of close up, but a little, little bit of wearing our heart on our sleeve and being open. Um, Y'all, this is what she is, she is drawn to in him. Everything that he has in his life is given over. You know, one of the pastors I listened to uh, with this series, he talked about this, about how men can become really good at a lot of things over time. You know, they can become really good at getting their lawn just right on the, on the, in the neighborhood, you know, or they can get, become really good at having, uh, you know, at a golf game or really good at growing a retirement account or making sure the kids are going to be taken care of for college or whatever it is. They can become really, really good at some things. But at the same time, the longer they're married, they can also become a little less open, a little less open, a little less open. And they've kind of gotten it twisted some kind of way that, yes, we are built to provide, but not just be a provider, it's, it's not just a robotic provider that's going to make sure everything's taken care of. 
No, there's something in the pledge that we had with our preparation that is supposed to tell a woman, I want to be open to you. Listen, I've struggled with this, okay? Guys, I know you probably struggle with this too. That's why I'm okay with being open about it. I've told you um, this book keeps bringing me things I've got to like, well, I've got to go talk to Anna again. I've got to go talk to Anna again, you know? And, and one of them is this for me because I don't know how many times in my life what I have done is before I get home, okay, I kind of make a conscious decision to say, well, you know, I, man, I'm, I'm struggling with this or this happened today or, or man, I, you know, it's, it's just kind of hard or emotionally I'm going through something hard. And how many times in my life have I, before I walked in the door, just kind of said, well, you know, I don't want to put that on her. You know, I want to save her from that. Like, I don't want her to feel what I'm feeling. And you know what it is? It's selfishness masquerading as chivalry. It's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to save her from that. No, it's not. I just don't want to deal with it. I would just rather kind of autopilot, go home, not have to reopen uh, this can again in order to bring her in and actually practice emotional openness and oneness. I'd rather just kind of leave it alone and act like I'm doing the knight in the shining armor thing. Oh, she doesn't need to. As if she can't handle the weight of my stuff, right? As, as if she can't handle the weight of my emotional. Man, what we need to do is fight against that urge. And I, and I, and I feel like the, the idea that Solomon has here of, of pledging his life, of showing that he is prepared. Yes, we're prepared for all this provision and all that. Guys, are we open? Are we prepared to open our lives to a woman? The second thing I would say is this, be prepared to provide. And that comes right out of the text as well. When you just think about, uh, man, all, uh, you know, all of the wealth that went into this and, and what is he showing her? He's showing her, there's nothing that I have that's not going to be yours. I don't want us to get kind of twisted in some of the things that I'm talking about here because, you know, it, some of this might make more sense next week when we talk about some of the other categories that God has uniquely built into women. But when I, when I think about this, it's like, being prepared to provide. That doesn't mean, okay, uh, that, that you're always gonna make the most money in the household, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. There was years where Anna was a sugar mama in our household, okay? It just was. Uh, I was in seminary and all this. Um, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm not saying you gotta be wealthy. That's certainly not what I'm saying Solomon was, but that's not the point. The point isn't, guys, what you have. The point is what you're willing to give. And I think that's the point. She is drawn here to the willingness that he has to say, whatever I've got, I'm, I'm putting into this. Like I'm pushing all the chips in. And so I would say this to the ladies as I've asked, hey, what should you be looking for in a man? Are there hints of that in the relationship now uh, that you're having? Uh, you know, ladies, are you thinking about, man, that if you think this is my guy or this is not my guy that I'm married to, this, this is a way to be praying for him, for openness, for preparation, okay, uh, or, or, or some things to affirm in him when you see it because this is certainly uh, what Solomon is doing, and I think it's, it's admirable. I think it's something we need to take. It takes her breath away how prepared he is to come and get her. Godly men are prepared. Second thing I want you to see comes right out of verse 7 and 8. Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Remember, that's kind of like a carriage or, or a couch that he's riding on. Around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and experts in war, each with a sword in, at his thigh against terror by night. What, what, what's going on here? You know, Solomon is giving her a show of force, if you think about it. You know, he, he's got 60 warriors that are running beside his carriage. David only had 30, okay? So he, he's got 60 warriors that are riding beside his carriage. What is he trying to communicate to her? What he's saying is, not on my watch. That's what he's saying. What he's saying is, if there is anything that I can do to protect you, Okay, that is what I'm willing to do. If it comes to it, the boy kind of goes down and the girl goes free. That story is being played out right here. That, that I, will go, I will go all the way to the lengths of anything that I can do. I'm not Superman, that, that I can be overcome, but to the, to the lengths of which I can go to protect you, I will. And that's what she says. So it's, a, it's a protection against the night. I want you to think about this. Have you ever been in a place where there was no electricity for like 100 miles? Because I have before, okay? And when you're there, you realize how dark dark actually is. <laughs> You realize that nighttime can be pretty scary. Now you go back about 3,000 years and you begin to realize like, man, there's a lot of superstition. Demons come out at night. Bandits come out at night. What she's saying is these 60 warriors have provided security for her. And that's the second thing I want you to see is that godly men have a category in their heart to protect Godly men should be protectors, okay? I, I don't know if you've ever noticed, there are many differences in men and women, uh, emotionally, physically, all of this. Physically, I want you to think about why it is that men and women are built differently.
differently because the scripture tells us plain as day. Adam was created more bone, bigger, you know, bigger, uh, more muscle density, taller. These are all generalities I know, but when you just think about generally, you know, men and women, why is that? Because he was built that way in order to, Genesis chapter 2, tend and keep the garden. It's because he was physically going to work. You know, the other way to think about translating tend and keep is to be a protector, is to be a provider. That is why he was built this way. He was built in order to protect. I, I know in our day and age, uh, there, there will be some of you, maybe even here today, probably in all of our servers, I want you to hear me with a little bit of grace here because there, there, you might be a woman where you're like, I don't need no protection from a man. Actually, that's not what I said. What I said is he was built to protect. Like it's a category in him. I'm not saying that you need it or not. What I'm saying is he has a category in his heart or should that is supposed to keep his head on a swivel and to look out for the garden around him and to look out for the marriage and to look out uh, for, for you. And so is that being drawn out? Is that being affirmed in him? I don't want you to think for one second that we've got this damsel in distress complex, okay? I have got two daughters that I'm raising and I promise you they are not being raised to feel like they need a man other than me. Okay, <laughs> I, want them to, I want them to see highly of me, nobody else. I don't, I, I'm kind of being facetious with that. I want to make sure that they don't walk through life feeling like, well, I've got to have a man for this or that or for anything, honestly. That's how I'm trying to raise my girls. It's not a damsel in distress type of thing. But we go back to Genesis 2, and it's just do we believe the Bible or not. If we believe the Bible and creation, then Adam was built, our forefather, men, was built to protect, to tend, and to keep, to keep his head on a swivel, to look out for those that are around him. It's a God-given thing in his life. A willingness to sacrificially protect ought to be looked for in a man, okay? Now, ladies, if you're walking with a guy and you're like, man, I don't know uh, if this is something that really is coming out in him very much, that's a red flag. You be thinking about that. This is something you can be praying for in, in the man that you have. If you're married or you can affirm this in him on the way home as you're driving home, man, I really, I do feel like that. I feel like that narrative of boy goes down, girls go free, uh, that, that narrative of you would put me on the lifeboat and go down with the ship, like I feel like you would do that. That could be affirmed uh, in him if that's something that is true of him. Now, exactly how, how can we play this out before we move on? Well, I would say this, all right? Godly protection, uh, category in a man. Guys, I hope I hope you're not, you know, I hope at your house, midnight, something goes bump in the night. You're not like elbowing your wife like, hey, babe, you're going to go check it out, you know, <laughs> tell me how it goes. You know, I hope that's not, I hope that's not it. That's the easy one, okay? That's the easiest thing. Man, there are so many more ways that this plays out when you start thinking about protection. Uh, Song of Solomon chapter 2, we didn't talk about this, and I don't know if we're going to talk about it again, so here it is, all right? The little foxes. She says to him, in, in, in chapter two, you can go back and read it. She says to him, it is your job, basically, to protect our love from the little foxes that want to come in and steal and ruin the garden. It is your job to protect us from those. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, the bump in the night, are you going to be the one that gets up or whatever? That's the easy part. The hard part is what we need to get our mind around. Guys, are you protecting her by protecting what you say about her to others? You know, that's a good idea. Are you protecting her by, by saying, I'm shutting down other avenues of ways that Satan might try to get a crack in this relationship? Are you protecting her by protecting your eyes and making sure things aren't coming through your eyes that get into your heart through pornography and, and, and different movies and things like that that we see? These are the ways that a godly man is built to protect, right? You think about Adam. He was built to protect. And what happened? The enemy comes into the garden and Adam does nothing. What should he have done? Fight, died, whatever, other than what he did. So what we have in Adam is this antitype for us. What we can't do is be passive when it comes to these things. We've got to fight to protect those that God has, has given to us, all right? Uh, no, number three, I would say, is this. And this is very close, so they kind of go together. Godly men lead. Uh, another thing that we see that comes out of verse 7 and 8 is that there is leadership here. Look at verse 7. Behold is the litter of Solomon. Around it are 60 mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel. I think this is something that we can extrapolate from this text. I think this is what we could see. Why is she drawn to him for over the 60 men that are running beside his carriage? Well, there's probably a few reasons. But one of them is most notably that I think she's smart enough to know if he can lead them, he could probably lead me. Like if he can lead them, he could probably lead my future sons. He can probably, you know, lead our family spiritually in the way that God has called him to do. Now, does that always work out? No, okay. 
Uh, I know plenty of guys that have gotten into trouble because their leadership outside the home, in the workplace, on the ball field, whatever, is incredible. And then by the time they get home, they got nothing left for their family. I know that that is something that many guys struggle with, and, and we've got to guard against that, okay? But ladies, this is what I'm going to tell you if you're dating somebody and you're trying to figure this out. Just because he leads outside the home don't mean that he will always lead in the home. But I've seen this play out enough to know, if there is no leadership outside of the home, it ain't going to be in the home either, <laughs> okay? So one's not a guarantee, but the other one sort of is. And so you got to be able to see now, 60 warriors running by the chariot, like how in the world are we supposed to bridge that about 3,000 years to today? Well, I think it's just a general idea. Is there leadership within his sphere of influence? You could say it like this, a good indicator of how a man will lead a family later is how they're leading in their sphere of influence now. That could be with friends, that could be on a ball team. Uh, that could be at, at work. I'm not saying he's the boss. I'm just saying, like, man, there's a Bible study at work. Is he involved? Is he the type of employee that a good moral uh, company, a good moral boss would say of that dude, hey, I, I wish I had 10 more like him? Good attitude. Uh, people are drawn to him, ar around him. Like, it, that, the, you can look in. Does he serve the church? How does it look in terms of community group? Man, is he trying to step out and take over things and help? Uh, is there leadership there? Because if there is, then there probably will be in the home too. You know, uh, coaches will tell you, all right? You think about coaches, football, whatever, basketball, any, any sport. They'll tell you, the way you get beat is by picking players off potential. <laughs> Potential's the worst indicator, Okay. You want to figure out what somebody's going to do, the best indicator is past performance. Or look at what they're doing right now. Don't pick off potential. Figure out. So that's what I'm saying. If you're dating somebody or you're, you're moving toward marriage, you need to be figuring this out. Wait a minute. What do they lead in now? Like how, how are they a leader right now? And, and that might be a good indicator of the way that they are going to lead you later. Let me do a little bit of an aside here, uh, just talking about masculinity and, and boys and the world, okay? Uh, and, and, then we'll, and then we'll move on to the fourth and, and final thing here. But guys, listen, is there anything that our world needs more than godly male leadership? I'm talking world, global, right? And I know what somebody's gonna say. They're gonna say, well, why has it gotta be male? Like, why are you saying godly male leadership? Because male leadership, if you haven't checked, is the problem in the whole world. It's the problem. I mean, you, you say, what do you mean? When, when, you, when you take, there's two extremes, okay? This is what happens. You take godly out, and this is what happens with men when it comes to leadership. The extreme over here is you take godly out and it turns into domination. Uh, who's the last ruthless dictator that oppressed their people that you know that wasn't a man? <laughs> you know, if you hear of a violent crime on the radio, eight out of 10 chance, it's a man. You think about the people that are falling from power because they're using their power to create sexual situations and advantages and, and using that power over people. Who is falling day after day after day? Oh, it's men. Do you know why? Because men are the problem in the world. You think about this. You think about if, if men, if the male problems cease to exist, it would not solve every problem in the world. It would pretty much solve every problem in the world. I mean, it would be, it would be very, very close. Why? Because when you take godly out Men still have this propensity to lead. It just simply turns in uh, to domination. That's what happens, okay? Some of you have experienced that. We're kind of laughing about it. Some of you experience that very, very personally. It turns into abuse and all this. Domestic violence, what would the percentage be if I just said like, oh, well, what, what, how, what is the percentage of people that get uh, you know, convicted of domestic violence? Think about it. We got a male problem, okay? It's domination. The other side though, and this is what I would say is just crazy that we can't do, the world looks in outside of the gospel, outside of, uh, of the Bible, and here's what they say. Well, we certainly have a male problem. I mean, there's just no denying that, okay? So we got a problem with men. What we want to do then, this is the world's answer, is we want to make sure that we convince everybody that there's no difference in a boy and a girl, okay? There's no difference in a man. Like, we got to take that out of them and, and try to make sure that we understand that there is no difference in a boy or a girl. It's absolutely crazy for this reason. The very problem shows us that that can't be the answer. Think about what I'm saying to you, Okay? If I say to you right now, there's somebody getting convicted of war crimes in the Congo without reading the story, you all know it's a man, <laughs> okay? And the fact that you all know that it's a man shows you that the answer cannot be that there's no difference because we all know it's a man, all right? So you can't swing all the way to the other side. You gotta think about these two things. One is domination. The world's answer is there's no difference. Well, what does that give us? It gives us things that are just as bad. They're just on a different scale like passivity, that we end up having work ethic issues, we end up having fatherlessness issues. Uh, the, the idea of kind of being raised to lead uh, is, is absent and crazy things kind of fill that void. This is fueling the pornography addiction. It's fueling all these things in our country. I saw a uh, 
are, I saw a stat the other day. By the time most, by the time the average American boy, male, uh, you know, delayed adolescence, what I'm talking about here, reaches the age of 21, they've played 15,000 hours of video games. That's two and a half years of your waking hours, by the way. Okay. Now, am I saying anything's wrong with video? No. My kids play video games. I played video games. All I'm saying is. When you start taking away this, this thing that's inside of a man to say, no, you need to be developed and nurtured to lead and lead a family, something will come in and take that void, you know? And, and it's funny to me, too, because what are all the video games? I'm saving the world. I'm a captain. I'm a general. I'm a leader. You know, that's what all the games are anyway. All I'm saying is the world's got it right. Domination on one side, passivity on the other. What we've got to do is say, no, no, wait, the Bible tells us these things. She looks in and she can see, wait a minute, there is something that God has created in him. If he can lead those guys, then he can lead me. And I'm supposed to be looking for that in him. And we're going to talk all about that next week, all right? So if that's confusing to you at all, uh, and actually my wife is going to, my wife's going to uh, do part of the sermon next week. I'm really excited about it. She's going to talk about what this should and shouldn't look like and some of these things. So if that's throwing you, man, give us another chance next week. But the idea is not to get away from male leadership, godliness. The idea is that we need to affirm what it looks like. If you're single, there's nobody in your life, it still looks like taking initiative. It still looks like being a good employee. You know, it, st it still looks like serving and groups and all of those things. Take initiative. Take the first step. Guys, some of you are like, man, I'm trying to be a godly leader in my home. She's not following you. Well, that, listen, if that's, it, you can't control that. What you can, you know, ultimately she don't follow you anyway. She follows Jesus by following you, okay? So if she's not following you, it's really not your issue. What you got to do is keep leading. You say, what is that? You're, you keep saying leading a lot. What does that look like? This is what I mean when I'm talking about leadership in the home. What I mean is saying, hey, babe, we got to be there. We, we, we can't miss group, you know? Like we, we can't, we can't miss, we can't, we need to serve. It looks like somebody in the house needing to stop the madness. And so a man in his initiative needs to say the debt is getting out of control. And what we got to do is clamp down here and we got to figure this out and go to Equip and Dave Ramsey or whatever it is. It looks like saying, hey, we for four or five days in a row rushed out of the house and ain't nobody picked up a Bible. Not the kids, not us. We haven't been in the word. We haven't prayed. Godly leadership in the home. It's not bossing people around all that. It's taking a step. To say, hey, we, we've got to, we got to get back here. We got to do this. We got to get better uh, uh, here. And that's what it looks like to be a godly leader. The way that he leads now in these all these inf in all these other spheres, y'all, it's going to be the way that he leads his family. So, what does that look like? All right, verse eleven. Let's get into the fourth and final thing here. Go out, O daughters of Zion, and look upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. I love this verse eleven. I'm going to talk about it again in just a minute. What they, what she says is, hey, go all. all all the daughters of Jerusalem, you come out, daughters of Zion, you come out and you gaze upon him and you tell me if his desire for me looks legit to you. Like you tell me if his desire stands up to the test or if he's just playing games. You look at it. And that's the fourth and final thing I want you to see is that godly men are known. Godly men can stand up to the light of the community shining in. Okay, if, you, if you're in a relationship right now, ladies, and this guy isolates all the time, it's always got to be around his friends, never going to come around your parents, won't step foot in the church to be around your godly community here. That is a major, major red flag. Now, don't hear more than I'm saying, okay? I'm not saying that everybody in every situation that your best friends got to approve, your parents got to, some people got crazy parents, okay? Some people got crazy friends, whatever. What I'm saying is the, the, in general, the godly community that you have around them is this dude willing to stand up and say, that's fine, I wanna be known. Like, I want them to see me. I want them to evaluate me. Is he willing to do that or is he always trying to isolate? Because, and this is gonna work both ways, really, but you guys know this, you get into a relationship, you get the googly eyes. You're like the last one that can see something that's obvious to everybody else. Godly friends and parents can often see things that you cannot see. So let us bring our people that we are coming into the same orbit it with, whatever you call it now, talking, dating, whatever it is, you bring them in to the community that they might be known, that somebody might be able to point something out to you that you don't see, or listen, affirm something. Some of you, are, you know, you didn't grow up in church. Uh, that's great. It's actually why we planted Mercy Hill Church. We want, you, we want you to be here, okay? Some of you did, though, and if you did, I'm going to tell you something. There is vestiges that are left over from True Love Waits, there are vestiges that are left over from I Kiss Dating Goodbye, okay? And some of those things were great. There are vestiges of those things that are left over, though, to where we always assume the answer is going to be no. 
Like we think, well, I'm 19 or 20 years old. That means the answer is gonna be no, that like I'm bringing somebody around and the community and my parents are gonna reject them. Man, I hope that's not the case at Mercy Hill because it shouldn't be. What we should do is, is look in and say, I wanna affirm the things that are godly here and be honest about the things that are not. It shouldn't be always no. There should be just an honesty there. I remember calling my dad. I was a sophomore uh, going into my junior year of college. It was the summertime, okay? And so I don't even know what, the, what age that is, 19 or 20 years old, I don't know. And, uh, and I was actually, actually I do, I was probably, I was probably 19, I, well, 19 or 20, I'm not sure. But either way, it's kind of young for nowadays, right? And I remember calling him, and I had enough respect for him to say, hey, man, I want to know what you think. Like, I'm thinking about asking Anna to marry me. And he says, well, what do you think she's going to say? <laughs> and I was like, man, I think I got about a 75% chance, okay? <laughs> and he's like, you're telling me you got a 75% chance. I'm like, yeah. He's like, you better get on it, dude. <laughs> He's like, she's going to figure you out before too much longer. You better put a ring on it. I mean, that was, his, that was his advice to me. Okay, I wasn't necessarily just like, oh, he's immediately going to say no. We shouldn't be that way with community groups, pastors. Man, that should not be our, our, our attitude towards these things. Man, let's, let's let people stand up. Let these dudes stand up to the light of community that is being shown in. If you've got godly parents there, if you've got godly people in your community group there, and let's see if they, if they stand up to being known, all right? Okay, look, we've gotten through four things. Prepare, protect, leadership. All right, are they known? Uh, this is a highly practical sermon, but I want to try to give us uh, a little bit of something we can go out on here that's, that's hopeful, okay? Because here's the problem with a sermon like this, and I, and I know. I've given you four things, man, write in your notes. This, guys, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go like fired up. Man, I'm going to go out. I'm going to lead. I'm going to be protecting. You know, I'm going I'm to do all this. I'm going to be known. I'm going to just kind of let what, whoever you want me to sit down. Well, all that stuff will last till about Tuesday. All the motivation, all of that will be, it'll be gone in a couple days. I fired you up, you know, did the best I could do. If I send you out like that, what's going to happen is we're not only going to lose our motivation, but somewhere around Tuesday, we're going to, we're going to sort of get crushed because we're going to realize, like, wait a minute, I got four categories and I fail in all four of them. I was a failure before I came in, and I'm going to be a failure this week. I'm not going to lead perfectly. I'm not going to be the type of person who's known. I'm going to isolate. I'm going to do these things because I'm human and I struggle with the flesh. And if all I leave you it with is a rah, rah, hey, let's go get at it, you know, we're going to be crushed by that because if you see in the Song of Solomon only an example, it will crush you every time. What we've got to see through the Song of Solomon, is that we're being pushed to a Savior. It's not just an example for us. It's someone who saves us for all the times that we have failed in these areas. And that's what I want to talk to you about for just a moment. You realize, and I hope you're realizing this, guys. Man, this ain't nothing new. I hope you realize when I start talking about Song of Solomon, like, you ain't the dude, right? You got that. You know what? Solomon wasn't the guy either. Solomon made these exact same promises to like 900 other women in his life, okay? Just so you know. So he, he, he got it all right in the book. He couldn't live it. It's not all right for him. You're not the guy. Solomon wasn't the guy. Who is this pushing us to? I've told you every single sermon and we'll continue to do so. Y'all, Jesus is the truer and better Solomon. Jesus is the ultimate Solomon. Uh, what should we see in this? Think about this with me. Think about it. Uh, verse 11, what does it say? Daughters of Zion, come and gaze upon him. What she says is, I want you to vouch for his love for me. And this is the question that I want to leave you with. This is what I want to ask you guys here tonight is this. If we can read the Song of Solomon and we can say prepared, protect, leads, known, if we would put a stamp on it and say Solomon surely loves his bride, then what happens when we start examining the true Solomon? Like if we can look at his gestures toward her and say he truly loves her and he's into her and he wants her, then what can we look at in the gestures of the true Solomon, Jesus Christ, and what he was willing to do for the bride. So what I wanna do is just kinda of ask the same question. She says, daughters of Zion, come gaze upon him. I wanna ask that to the church. Daughters of Zion, sons of Zion, church, let us gaze upon the true Solomon. Here he comes, do you see him? He comes from the wilderness. But unlike Solomon, he's not riding in a carriage that was inlaid with gold and purple, right? that was inlaid with Solomon. See, Solomon prepared this carriage that he might carry his bride to the wedding. Well, what was the instrument in which Jesus carried you and I to the wedding? Because it sure wasn't inlaid with gold and purple and silver. It was inlaid with bone and flesh and blood. It was the cross. It wasn't beautiful. It was ugly. Behold the Solomon. Behold the greater Solomon that comes. Think about this. Solomon comes, and what's he doing? Oh, man, it's his wedding day. He smells right, perfume, frankincense, myrrh. He was anointed. Jesus was anointed, too. It wasn't on the day of his wedding. It was on the day of his death. 
Jesus wore a crown too. It wasn't for the wedding. It was a crown of thorns. You see, if all of these things in Solomon's life point us to say he loved the bride, what happens when we see the things that Christ has done for us? Solomon won his bride by having beauty and wealth, right? That's great. That's fine. I, I push some of that. Be prepared, all that. What does it look like when Jesus Christ comes and wins his bride through giving those things away? I'm talking about total emptiness. That's what he's done for you and I. For all of our failures, it took Jesus Christ on the cross. He took the penalty for our sin. It wasn't beautiful. It was ugly, but he was willing to go the distance for us. That is his love for us, and that should win us over to him. That he went to the cross, canceled the penalty of our sin, comes up out of the grave, says, hey, come join me in the newness of life. Be a partaker in the divine nature. I'm going to throw my robes of righteousness over you. I'm going to take on all of the penalty and curse for your sin. I'm going to make you white as snow. See, let me, let me talk to the guys and then the, and then the ladies in here, and that's it, okay? Guys, as I start talking about these things, it can be crushing to us. Some of us in here with some big stuff that are going on right now. I mean, you're like, man, I'm in the throes of trying to break an addiction, Maybe you're thinking to yourself, man, I got divorced in my past. The truth be told, it wasn't her fault. You're thinking to yourself right now, I'm not reconciled to my kids. I don't know what it is that you have, I don't know what it is when I say, are you defined by your greatest failure? What comes to your mind? But you know what? Because of the cross, you don't have to be defined by that. Because of the cross, what wasn't yours in terms of a claim to the family of God has become yours. Here's what that means. You have a new last name, that the robe has been thrown over you, that when God looks upon you, I know what I said earlier, like you ain't the dude, right? I mean, we, we can't. But when God looks at us, that's what he sees. He looks at us as spotless. He looks at us righteous like his son. And what that does in our, in our life, guys, we got two options tomorrow. We can go out here fired up. We're going to fail by Tuesday, okay? When we fail, we can cower because of our failure, or what we can realize together is, man, no matter what I do tomorrow or Tuesday or Wednesday, God already sees me as the ultimate man. He sees me as having never failed. He has given me a new last name. And when we get that in our mind, it will motivate us to live into these categories, not fear over failing in them. You see, so let us go out of here with a renewed conviction to be a godly man, not because we're going to win something from God, but because we have been given something amazing by God. And ladies, I would say this, okay? Uh, some of you are, are walking through, um, you know, I'll give you just, just three different ways to apply it. First of all, some of you are in a relationship where you're like, man, I know he's not perfect and I'm not perfect, but we're trying to live these things out and he's trying to live these things out. And I see them. That's good. That means there's a lot of maturity in your relationship. Are you sharing your life with some of the younger ones in community group, people that you serve with? Are you inviting them over? You're like, you know, mentorship. We don't need a program. You don't need a book. Invite somebody over for lunch. Invite them over for dinner. Get them into your life. Guys, this is where you're at. If your wife would say, I see those categories and you're growing, you're a mature man, you realize, do you know how many people in our church maybe don't have some of the background that you have? Here's what I thought about. We had one of our college students that came up to me after the Thursday service and he said, man, after the sermon, I called my dad immediately. And I was just like, thank you for all this stuff that I didn't even realize that you've kind of taught me over my life, you know? And, and I said, what was going on? And he said, man, I went on a date on like last week and there was kind of a, kind of a you know, crazy situation downtown and, and I could tell that the girl I was with kind of tensed up and he's like, just without even thinking about it, I knew to just move over on the other side and put myself in between her and the situation and nothing happened, we just walked on past and it was fine. But he's like, I wouldn't have known that if my dad didn't like show me that and model that for me. And, and I thought, man, that's great. Godly men of Mercy Hill, do you know how many people there are at our church that didn't have a godly father like that? They didn't have somebody tell them that stuff. And they're reading the Bible and they're trying to figure it out and they're in a group and they're doing the best they can. Man, grab one of those guys. When they come in the door, man, that's mine. I'm a, I'm a guy, hey, let's go to lunch, man. Get on a serve team. You know, and if you don't know any people like that, maybe that's an indicator of your involvement in the church. Because I don't know many of the godly men that I'm thinking of that aren't making themselves available enough through serving, through group, through being here all the time, all that. Man, they know some of these young guys and they can grab them and they can get, they can get in relationships with them. So be a mentor if you're already in maturity, all right? Second category I would say is some of you are dating somebody right now and you're like, man, I'm going through these four categories and that ain't the dude. Then you need to break up, <laughs> okay? And you're like, is that it? Yeah, that's it. You're like, I mean, there's no, gra I'm not, don't, no grace, no, just break it. You ain't got to be a jerk about it. I mean, I wouldn't do it over Snapchat, but I mean, <laughs> you know, like, you, you need to get out. And the reason I say that is this, getting married is the second most important decision of your life if you choose to do so. I mean, you're becoming one flesh. You're losing part of yourself. You're gaining part of somebody else. It's a big deal. You don't want to do that just haphazardly. If this ain't the dude, then go find somebody else who is, Okay. 
And, and, and I would say, and, and, and listen, every, you know, you, I'm not saying to be too harsh. I'm kind of being funny. You might be looking in, and maybe he ain't that guy right now. Is he trying? Is he in a group? Does he have mentors in his life? What are his groomsmen going to look like? Are they a bunch of knuckleheads? Get out, okay? You just don't be. And I'm, I'm being kind of funny, but I'm trying to be serious as well. By the way, I'm going to say the same thing to the guys next week. I mean, the exact same thing, okay? Many times this is what we do. We think it's good for us to marry the person we love. C.S. Lewis said, it is much better to marry the person who loves you well, <laughs> right? Are they going to love you the right way? That's more important. So if, if it's not there, man, let, move on. Let's, let's find somebody else, okay, if, if God has not gifted you a singleness. Last thing I'll say is this, all right? Some of you in here are just thinking to yourself, I'm here. Uh, I'm, I feel, you know, I'm married. This ain't the guy. He's not even here. It's four categories. Doesn't care, all that. I understand there's probably an incredible amount of pain that goes with this. And thinking about all these things. But this is what I would tell you. The Bible has given you an, an action step. You need to pray for that guy. You need to pray that God is going to move his hand for him in his life. You need to try to get him around community. You need to model Christ-likeness around him. Okay? And, 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 and here's the thing. You know, you know how many testimonies I've heard like this? Just because he's that guy now don't mean he always will be. God might move in his life. So let's pray for them and let's model for them. All right? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time, and uh, God, I pray right now, um, Lord, that we, this weekend, next week, will take this image of God stuff, manhood, womanhood, extremely seriously. God, I pray that we be motivated by who you have called us to be. We already have a new last name. You have already saved us from all the times that we failed in manhood. God, let that motivate us to want to live into who you have called us to be and take growth steps in these categories this week. In Christ's name, amen.